Hey, good day to all of you watching this presentation. This is Tom McMillan Oakley coming to you live from Jackson, Michigan. I will share with you that this was totally out of my wheelhouse, as I'm used to doing lectures and having feedback and input from my students after I get done talking. This presentation seems a bit one-sided to me, so I'll look forward to your comments and questions in the forum. My slides are information only. My comments are my take on what we're doing and what is presented on the slides. Today we're going to talk about semiotics and how they can work with our collective interpretation of art and its meaning. There's a lot to unpack here, so let's get started. So, to begin, a definition. And this is what is listed in the book. And I wanted to start off by saying this was a challenging week for me. I have never really delved into this subject at this level before, or so I thought. The readings were interesting and pointed us in new paths in our studies. But on to the presentation. It's important to remember here that semiotics can help translate a picture into words and give meaning where there may or may not be implied by the artist. We have this gentleman to thank for this science, published posthumously in the early 1900s. This body of work has been in constant flux as we as society evolve and our collective language grows. It's important to remember the pronunciation of his name, Saussure, as Chassier is a French brown sauce with mushrooms. Thank you, Food Network. And we also need to remember that an important distinction must be made as linguistics is a study of words and language, while semiotics is a study of signs. When we look at the word and you go back to its um, original Greek root, semion, which means sign. If you look at the rather graphic um, or complicated graphic on the page, you recognize many of them from your drive into work, to school, or to the grocery. As a society, we've agreed that the red octagon with S-T-O-P requires you to stop and allow for other traffic and pedestrians to pass. This is where the correlation between linguistics and semiotics gets muddy. But if you travel to Spain and you're driving, you'll see the familiar sign, but the wording is different. Instead of S-T-O-P, it may have P-A-R-E or A-L-T-O, both meaning stop in Spanish. To help clarify, Saussure created the two different components, parole and long, an example similar to the stop sign. And as a community, we can agree that the, the letters C-H-A-I-R mean share, something you would sit on, and that's where parole and long are used. But then we get back into the linguistics of it all. The book uses the example of the letters C-A-T, meaning a domesticated feline mammal, the signifier. The authors take it further to express the name of their cat, Tittles, the signified. And here I am with my cat, oh, excuse me, C-A-T, the signifier, who is Eddie, the signified. Now, this is a rather um, extreme Germanic example. Um, this video has been uh, much lampooned. People think it's rather um, somewhat stereotypical in its portrayal of the different cultures, but it does speak to how crazy um, one language can sound against the other. So let's watch the video together, and we'll unpack it once we're done. Hopefully this will work. Science. 
hippopotam. Hippopotam. So, um, as you can see, that is um, a rather silly example, but I thought, um, you know, as a society, we have all we we all have somewhat common names for the items around us, the signifiers. Um, but it's how the signified comes across can sometimes be radically different, especially if you're using the German language, as we just saw. A lovely word that evokes diaphanous creatures fluttering about in a garden in many of the Romance languages um, is quite poetic and almost lyrical. But however, in German, the Schmetterling just doesn't match up to the signified butterfly. So this begs the question, regarding the connection between linguistics and semiotics. If different languages interpret things with radically different words, how does that relate to art and its creation? So I ask the question, how does this reply to art? In Kosuth's piece here, um, it exists only as a piece of paper signed by the artist, stating how the display should be set up with the stated definition to use. It is up to the curator or the museum to make the rest of this happen by supplying the chair, taking the photo, and assembling it. The display can be different in its choice of chair, but the implied meaning is always the same. Kossuth, like other artistic pranksters such as Magritte and Duchamp, play with our expectations and notions of what is art and what we perceive as art and how our words shape that meaning. For many, what Magritte and Duchamp brought to the table with the treachery of images and fountain lit the way for the craziness that came with the advent of conceptual art and all of its shenanigans. So, <clears throat> pardon me, prior to getting into Krauss and her take on Picasso, let's take one more look at art created with words that may or may not exist. Here we have um, a copy of Yoko Ono's, one of her instructions for painting, which were done in 1960 and then published in the magazine Grapefruit, or the book Grapefruit, in 1962. Let's listen to her words for a minute, um, and she kind of digs quite deep into this. Instruction painting separates painting into two different functions, the instructions and then the realization. The work becomes a reality only when other, others realize the work. Instructions can be realized by different people in many different ways. This allows infinite transformation of the work that the artist himself cannot foresee and brings the concept of time, in quotes, into painting. It immediately eliminates, eliminates the usual emphasis put on the original painting, and art comes down from the pedestal. Instruction painting makes it, makes it possible to explore the invisible, the world beyond the concept of time and space. And then, sometimes later, the instructions themselves will disappear and be properly forgotten. That was uh, Yoko Ono talking at Indica Gallery in London in 1966. Now, Ono has given us a series of words, both in English and in Japanese, depending on which one you are looking at, and it's created an idea that may or may not ever be realized, especially the one on the slide. Yikes. So, I'm a big fan of Ono, and I know that she was greatly influenced by Picasso in his, quote, discovery of collage in the early 1900s. So I was ready to dive in to Krauss's study. And I, I do have to admit, I found this whole part of the assigned reading almost unreadable. While I respect Krauss's work and study, this type of course leaves me and many of my students quite cold. But her renaming of Perot and Long to the, Denotation and connotation does make sense. It makes the study of semiotics a little bit more accessible to all. When Krauss goes on and on about the F holes represented in the Picasso collage, she takes what was probably a stream of conscious artistic activity done in a relatively short time, Picasso's collage, and debates its deeper meaning. Did Picasso intend, here we go again with intent, um, those F holes to represent a violin? or were they included to designate something else on the picture plane? I found this whole debate and discourse uh, kind of laughable. But we move on, which is one of the reasons why I prefer the biographical study of art and art history. It puts the artist and their intent back into the picture. I know you all are probably sick of hearing about my students and their comments in class, but as an art history instructor, sometimes the artist is much more interesting than their work. So, <clears throat> pardon me, if we use a semiotic approach to Picasso's La Vie, 
housed in my home state of Ohio at the amazing Cleveland Museum of Art, we see a grocery list of all that is there. And that I just did a few of them in the bullets there. Uh, but very little else goes into it. Inferences can be made, for sure, but until we put the lens of Picasso on the work, its intended meaning remains hidden. And I don't think Picasso even knew what many of his paintings were about. If you read the quote here, which I love, it says he reportedly finished his sentence with a shrug, so who knows? He didn't even know that. Um, Picasso was a habitual creator. He created over 51,000 pieces of artwork in his lifetime. And I have to wonder, did he ascribe meaning to each and every piece, or did he make them just to make them? Art for art's sake. But from a biographical approach, <coughs> pardon me, allergies, we get a much more um, interesting read on this amazing piece done by Picasso. And they say that a picture is worth a thousand words, and here it is very true. Much more comes to light as we know that Picasso's friend, um, had issues with impotence and was pretty unlucky in love. His hand gesturing towards a child, which he would never be able to produce, mimics Adam's flaccid hand reaching towards God's hand in Michelangelo's Creation of Man. Germain, the jilted lover, um, her facial expression is rather bland and neutral. And an interesting tidbit here, Picasso had a morbid fear of blindness, which was one of the the symptoms of syphilis. In the blind man's meal, a man struck blind by the disease has dinner. Was it the dinner or the Eucharist? The reason I'm bringing this painting up is that one of my trips, in one of my trips to the Met in New York, I found out that this painting of the crouching female in La Vie, right here, um, which has been hunted for years, is actually under this painting right here. And here is an x-ray of it, which I think is pretty darn cool. So, when we reduce art to mere words and signs, I think we lose the humanity of it all. What could be as a, seen as a painting of a man resting with a candle burning nearby becomes much more deeper and compelling as we realize it's a posthumous tribute to his dear friend who committed suicide after attempting to take the life of his love interest, Germain. As mentioned earlier, this was a challenging week for me, but after looking at how we go about using semiotics and how it could help us unpack what's offered in the art, it does indeed help with understanding. So in conclusion, I feel that semiotics have their place in our canon, but when we remove the artist from the mix, we are missing an important piece of understanding the art and its ultimate purpose. Have a great week, folks. We'll see you in the forums. And by the way, if you'd like to dig deeper into what I've discussed, check out the Works Cited page attached to my post. Have a great day.